the exam is going clinical and we are ready for it dear students i am dr malcolm your faculty of dermatology at maro so in this session we'll be discussing various clinical vignettes in dermatology so in the exam we are going to be encountering a situation where a patient and the clinical situation is given to us okay and we know that dermatology can be pretty confusing with relation to the shapes distribution size so i am going to go in a algorithmic fashion and teach you as to how you can narrow down your differential diagnosis to arrive at the right answer so when we are discussing clinical vignettes we'll begin with the first topic of clinical dermatology case scenario number 1 an adult presenting with a annular plaque with central clearing so we already know in dermatology annular is a ring shaped lesion so the word annular means a ring shaped lesion which is generally active in its periphery two important differential diagnosis to consider number 1 tinea corporis tinea corporis second important differential diagnosis here is granuloma annulare granuloma annulare now how do we distinguish these two conditions in the exam number 1 when we look at tinea very important you can see the border of this lesion so you see the border of this lesion is scaly so you get a scaly well defined margin and please remember students tinea or dermatophytosis is a itchy condition so pruritus will be present and how will i confirm my diagnosis all i have to do is a 10% potassium hydroxide mount and i will be able to visualize the branching filaments of the dermatophytes whereas when i look at granuloma annulare again the annular plaque again the central clearing then how will i distinguish very very important granuloma annular is a asymptomatic condition so there is no itching here so this is number 1 number 2 very very important there is no scaling here so no scaling no itching these are the two important no's for granuloma annulare which will help us to distinguish from tinea corporis and please remember generally the site of distribution is going to be on the dorsum of the extremities dorsum of the extremities and then what is this condition associated with it is associated with diabetes mellitus it is associated with diabetes mellitus and additional point to remember what is granuloma annulare it is classified as a necrobiotic disorder it is classified as a necrobiotic disorder necrobiosis what does it mean necrobiosis means collagen degeneration necrobiosis means collagen degeneration second case scenario an adult male or a female presenting with a papulo squamous eruption so what do you mean by papulo squamous eruption means papules and plaques squama means scales so when papulo squamous lesions are mentioned in the exam five important differential diagnosis we need to consider number 1 is psoriasis number 2 is lichen planus number 3 pityriasis rosea number 4 secondary syphilis and number 5 atopic eczema let us take it one by one so when we look at a patient of psoriasis what is the lesion of psoriasis you can see there are red scaly papules and plaques so point number 1 patient is going to present with red scaly papules and plaques so you can see here the smaller ones are called papules the larger ones are called plaques the smaller lesions are called papules bigger lesions are called plaques so this is point number 1 point number 2 look at the scales of psoriasis they are described as silvery white scales and generally the distribution of psoriasis is going to be on the extensor aspect of the body so these are the important points to make a diagnosis of chronic plaque psoriasis next we want to lichen planus how is the lesion of lichen planus going to be we have to remember the six p's of lichen planus it goes like this purple and pruritic so color is purple the symptom is itch purple and pruritic next to polygonal and plain topped polygonal and plain topped and the last two p's are papules and plaques papules and plaques so here we can clearly appreciate the multiple purplish lesions and you can see the distribution students it is classically going to be distributed over the flexor surfaces of the body 
classical flexor in distribution. We remember psoriasis is predominantly an extensor disease. Lichen planus is predominantly a flexural disease. And always examine the oral cavity because in 40 to 60 percent of the patients, we can have reticulate lacy white patterns reticulate lacy white pattern please remember the meaning of the word reticulate reticulate means net like the word reticulate means net like pattern the third important differential diagnosis is pityriasis rosea now while thinking about pityriasis rosea what are the important points to remember number one the first lesion in pityriasis rosea as we can see here is referred to as a herald patch so point number one is a herald patch Point number two, the scales of pityriasis rosea, where it is difficult to appreciate in this picture, it is going to be described like the collar of a neck. That's why this is referred to as collarate of scales. This is referred to as collarate of scales. And the distribution, we can see along the lines of Langer, this is referred to as Christmas tree pattern. This is referred to as Christmas tree pattern. So these will be the points in the exam which will help us to make a diagnosis of pityriasis rosea. The next important differential diagnosis for a papillosquamous eruption is secondary syphilis. Now obviously when I say secondary syphilis students please remember there should have been primary syphilis isn't it? So what history I'm going to ask? We know the ulcer of syphilis is painless. So ask for a painless genital ulcer. So history of a painless genital ulcer has to be elicited. And when you look at the morphology of the rash you generally get a polymorphic rash, you get a polymorphic symmetric rash, generally asymptomatic, generally asymptomatic, but please remember this point that very characteristic involvement in the exam is going to be the involvement of the palms and soul. So please remember almost every patient of secondary syphilis is going to be having the involvement of the palms and soul that is very very characteristic of secondary syphilis. And lastly, the fifth important differential diagnosis is atopic eczema. So it can look papillosquamous but please remember the most important history of atopic eczema will be a history of atopy. Now what is atopy? Please remember it is a localized type 1 hypersensitivity reaction and just like for example in our medicine posting we ask history of diabetes hypertension to most of our patients isn't it so similarly in every dermatology case we ask history of atopy so atopy can manifest in three systems number one in the upper respiratory tract it is going to present with recurrent allergic rhinitis so this is point number one recurrent allergic rhinitis number two in the lower respiratory tract the patient is going to present with bronchial asthma and number three, how is it going to present in the skin? In the skin, it is going to present as atopic dermatitis. It is going to present as atopic dermatitis. Now, the morphology of atopic dermatitis depends on the stage. In the infantile phase, you have faces involved, scalp is involved and extensors are involved. But please remember students that in childhood and in the adult phase, we are going to be having the involvement of the flexures flexures get involved, you can get red excoriated scaly plaques, red excoriated scaly plaques. So this looks like a papillosquamous lesions, red scaly excoriated plaques. But please remember the most important history we need to know at MBBS level is how to distinguish psoriasis from eczema. Please remember ask history of oozing. So when I say oozing that means it is probably referring to an eczematous process. So it's very, very important to ask history of oozing here for the diagnosis of atopic eczema. Next, let us go to the differential diagnosis in bullous disorders. Let's take up a case scenario here. So here, let us take there's an adult male or a female who is going to be presenting with vesiculo bullous lesions. So let us see how we should approach a bullous disorder. So when we're doing bullous disorders, let us look at the different levels of fluid collection and their clinical correlation. So here you can see a picture epidermis and dermis and in the epidermis the uppermost layer is stratum corneum the lowermost layer is stratum basale and there are three levels of fluid collection which i'm describing in this image so number one the first is going to be just below stratum corneum and this is going to be called as subcorneal bulla so this is a subcorneal bulla the next bulla which is just above the basal layer is going to be called as supra basal bulla it's a supra basal blister. 
and then the bulla which is just below the epidermis this is going to be called as sub epidermal blister this is going to be called as sub epidermal blister so you have sub corneal supra basal sub epidermal blister now why are we learning all these levels of the blister so that it translates into clinical practice that means we have sub corneal supra basal sub epidermal blister let us see how a sub corneal blister will be a sub corneal blister is going to be very flaccid it ruptures very easily very easily ruptures and it generally heals with normal skin it generally heals with normal skin when you are looking at a supra basal blister it is a flaccid bulla it easily ruptures and generally the bulla is going to heal with hyperpigmentation and when you think of a sub epidermal blister which is very deep you are going to be having a tense blister you do not rupture easily do not uh, rupture easily it does not rupture easily because it is deeper within the skin and usually heals with hypopigmentation sometimes even with milia small epidermal inclusion cyst can be there and rarely with even scarring rarely can be associated with scar formation so this is a very very important table this table will tell you a lot of information to diagnose in the exam now when a bullous disorder comes in the exam first you classify it is it a flaccid bulla or a tense bulla as soon as you see the word flaccid bulla the level has to be intra epidermal and whenever there is a tense bulla i just now told you think about sub epidermal blistering diseases and please remember students whenever the word intra epidermal comes always think about the pemphigus group the pemphigus group which is the superficial group and whenever you are thinking of the sub epidermal blistering disorders always think about pemphigoid group which are the deeper bullous lesions and one more important disorder which is deeper is dermatitis herpetiformis dermatitis herpetiformis next is when we talk about a flaccid blister in a autoimmune blistering disorder if mucosa is spared then we think of pemphigus foliaceus and if there is mucosal involvement then we are going to make a diagnosis of pemphigus vulgaris then we are going to make a diagnosis of pemphigus vulgaris and next now you can see this is a patient of pemphigus foliaceus you can see the different lesions over here these are referred to as scales and crusts and please remember the distribution of pemphigus foliaceus is very very important this is referred to as seboric distribution so what are seboric distribution or sites these are the areas where which are rich in sebaceous glands like for example you have the face scalp chest and the upper back so you are going to have seboric lesions okay in the distribution of seboric areas and if you look at the slide here you can see this is the stratum corneum this is the stratum basale you can see there is a split just below the stratum corneum this is called as subcorneal bulla and if you look at a patient of pemphigus vulgaris what do you see here is you can see this flaccid bullae so how do i know there is flaccidity you can see wrinkles on the surface so this is the flaccid bulla these bullae are going to rupture and you can see when they are rupturing what is happening is they tend to extend so these are the erosions of pemphigus vulgaris and because of the process of acantholysis what is happening they tend to extend they tend to extend no healing no healing and then when you look at the histopathology of this patient you can see that this is going to be the stratum corneum this is the stratum basale and we see that the level of the blister is just above the basal layer this is going to be called as supra basal split supra basal split okay and then you're going to have few rounded cells over here these are going to be called as acantholytic cells so these are going to be called as acantholytic cells and we see that the basal layer remains intact it remains attached to the basement membrane zone and this is going to be called as row of tombstone appearance row of tombstone appearance is the histopathology of pemphigus vulgaris
and please remember students the investigation of choice in any autoimmune blistering disorder is going to be direct immunofluorescence because this is the test by which you can visualize the pathogenic auto antibodies as to where how and which pattern it's depositing so in pemphigus vulgaris please remember we get igg c3 which is going to be deposited intra epidermally in an intercellular pattern and this pattern is going to be called as fish net pattern this pattern is going to be called as fish net pattern very classical for pemphigus vulgaris now let us see how do we approach this particular topic of sub epidermal blistering disorders or this tense bullet so when you're looking at tense bullet we could have three situations the first situation is a patient who is an elderly patient who is going to be presenting with itchy bullet which are located on a red base or a urticarial base located on the limbs and the trunk and dif is positive so if you have a tense bullet in a older patient which is very very itchy we make a diagnosis of bullous pemphigoid we make a diagnosis of bullous pemphigoid if there is a patient who has extreme pruritus pruritus is very very high and number 2 the patient is going to present with elbow blisters that means when i say elbow i'm talking about extensor distribution and they are group blisters so when i say grouped the word herpetiform mis comes into the picture because grouped is the other name for herpetiformis and there can be association with celiac disease or gluten sensitive enteropathy and dif is positive then my diagnosis is dermatitis herpetiformis dermatitis herpetiformis so students please remember dermatitis herpetiformis is a disease which is mediated by immunoglobulin a dermatitis because it is extremely pruritic herpetiformis is because of the grouped configuration of the lesions and the third situation is when a child presents with a string of pearls appearance and it's again a iga mediated disorder so this is going to be called as cbdc cbdc stands for chronic bullous disease of childhood so chronic bullous disease of childhood so what we have to do is now onwards we are supposed to remember the clinical history and the pattern that will help us to make a diagnosis here so for example the first condition was bullous pemphigoid i just mentioned to you, you get a lot of tense bullae here you get a lot of tense bullae mainly on the limbs and extremity they are very very pruritic they are itchy conditions sometimes on a red base that's bullous pemphigoid dermatitis herpetiforme is extremely pruritic grouped kind of a pattern which you can see here excoriations are seen this is dermatitis herpetiforme please remember the distribution is generally over the extensor aspects of the body and here i told you about a disease called as cbdc chronic bullous disease of childhood what is the string of pearl pattern you can see the vesicles which are arranged in a annular pattern you can see this vesicles are arranged in a annular pattern this has been given a name of string of pearl appearance also known as cluster of jewel appearance next we look at some clinical scenarios in pigmentary disorder the first scenario is there is a unilateral lesion which is located on the face since early childhood or birth with no photosensitivity when this kind of a question comes in the exam unilateral facial lesion no photosensitivity since early childhood we can have two important differential diagnoses in mind number 1 port wine stain number 2 is going to be nevus of ota number 2 is going to be nevus of ota now let us see how to distinguish between port wine stain and nevus of ota number 1 is color so please remember students the most important thing in dermatology is color the color of port wine stain as the name says is purplish red nevus of ota is a ceruloderma that is it is a blue color lesion blue to slate gray this is going to be blue to slate gray in color next is the treatment the treatment of port wine stain is pulse dye laser pulse dye laser whereas the treatment of nevus of ota is q switched endiag laser q switched endiag laser which is mainly for pigment what is this port wine stain associated with so if there is a patient with a facial port wine stain with epilepsy in the brain and glaucoma in the eye so please remember if there is neurooculocutaneous involvement then i'm going to be calling it as sturge weber syndrome
then I'm going to be calling it as Sturge Weber syndrome. Whereas when I talk about nevus of Ota, please remember it is going to be following the first and the second division of the trigeminal nerve. That is why face is involved and sclera is involved in two thirds of the patients. So two thirds of the patients are going to be having scleral involvement. Let us now look at the picture of a port wine stain. You can see this unilateral lesion, which is there since birth. It's purplish red in color. This is going to be called as a port wine stain. Pulse dye laser is the treatment for this condition. This is nevus of Ota. You can see it follows the first and the second division of the trigeminal nerve. So that is why scleral involvement is seen in two thirds of the patients. Let's take up case scenario two in pigmentary disease. So here there is a patient presenting with a unilateral lesion, which is hyperpigmented, located over the chest and the upper shoulder. With these three important points, there are two important differential diagnoses I would want to consider. Number one is going to be Becker's nevus. Number two, nevus of Ito. Nevus of Ito. So what are the differentiating points here? Number one, always remember, first is the onset. So please remember Becker's nevus is acquired condition. So when I say acquired, it is usually under the influence of the androgens, which is going to be active at the time of puberty. So the lesion appears during puberty. Nevus of Ito is seen since birth or early childhood. Birth or early childhood. Second point is the color. So very simple, the color of Becker's is going to be brown to black. Whereas the color of Nevus of Ito is going to be blue to slate gray. Blue to slate gray. And if you look at the surface of a Becker's Nevus, hair is going to be present. Hair is going to be absent in Nevus of Ito. So that is how we distinguish Becker's Nevus and Nevus of Ito. So students, please try to learn these conditions like this. So this will help you to easily differentiate between these two disorders. So here you can see a Becker's nevus, which is a unilateral lesion, hyperpigmented, hypertrichotic. Hypertrichotic means hair is present, located over the chest and the upper shoulder. And if the question says it is an acquired condition at puberty, your diagnosis is Becker's. Whereas you can see nevus of Ito, it follows the posterior supraclavicular nerve. Posterior supraclavicular nerve and lateral brachial cutaneous nerve lateral brachial cutaneous nerve. So the distribution is going to be on the shoulder and the scapular region. Just remember the color of nevus of Ito is going to be blue to slate gray because the problem is in the dermis here. Next case scenario number three, this is a hyperpigmented hypertrichotic lesion. So if the exam says this hyperpigmentation, hypertrichosis, two important differential diagnoses. Number one, congenital melanocytic nevus, congenital melanocytic nevus, Number two is Becker's nevus. Number two is Becker's nevus. So when I say congenital melanocytic nevus, this is a benign proliferation of the nevus type of melanocyte. Please remember the most important point to distinguish between congenital melanocytic nevus and Becker's is congenital melanocytic nevus is congenital. It is going to be seen since birth, whereas Becker's have already just now discussed it is an acquired disorder. And one extra point which was asked in the recent NEET exam is always remember if the size is more than 20 centimeter, we are going to be calling it as giant congenital melanocytic nevus. And these patients always have to be under surveillance. We have to closely look at them because there is a 2 to 5 percent chance in the future to develop melanoma. So melanoma can be one development in these patients in 2 to 5 percent when the size of the nevus is going to be more than 20 centimeters. Next, let us look at some appendages and disorders and the case scenarios here. So number one, case scenario is of a child or an adult presenting with loss of hair. So in the exam, we know loss of hair is called alopecia. And when we're thinking about alopecia, we want to broadly classify them into scarring alopecia and non-scarring alopecia scarring alopecia and non-scarring alopecia. So this is the broad categorization. Let us look at some important causes of scarring and non-scarring alopecia. Now under scarring alopecia, the first condition, the question is going to come like this in the exam students, a child presents with a boggy scalp swelling, easily pluckable hair and regional lymph nodes are enlarged. 
and sometimes in the exam they may also say this history of contact with the pet why do they call this pet in the question because the pet is going to tell you zoophilic fungi zoophilic fungus and the correct answer for this question is going to be kirion kirion is a type of tinea capitis inflammatory type so this is the first differential diagnosis second important differential diagnosis here is scarring alopecia presenting with peri follicular blue gray hue so if there is a peri follicular blue gray hue mentioned a diagnosis is going to be lichen plano pilaris lichen plano pilaris is the type of lichen planus which involves the hair follicle producing scarring alopecia and if the question says there is central atrophy plus scarring periphery shows hyperpigmentation and the scales are very adherent type my diagnosis is going to be discoid lupus erythematosus it's a type of lupus erythematosus which is generally restricted to the skin it is called as dle now quickly looking here you can see there's a child presenting with a boggy scalp swelling easily pluckable hair regional lymph nodes when you palpate will be enlarged diagnosis is kirion tinea capitis inflammatory type second important thing lichen plano pilaris is going to be presenting with peri follicular blue gray hue that's the clue to pick up lichen plano pilaris and the key pick up word here is a discoid plaque so you can see this plaques here there are multiple discoid plaques you can see they can present on the scalp center shows atrophy plus scarring periphery shows hyperpigmentation and the types of scales which are described here is called as adherent scales my diagnosis is going to be discoid lupus erythematosus the second important manifestation of alopecia is non scarring alopecia so here let us take up this clinical scenario there is a well defined smooth circular patch with complete hair loss is suggestive of alopecia areata alopecia areata the second situation which is mentioned here is a bizarre shaped bald patch with broken hairs of varying length this is giving me a context of a psychiatric illness and this is going to be called as trichotillomania trichotillomania and sometimes the exam may also say incomplete loss of hair within the patch so now we understand the difference between these two conditions the word complete is used it is alopecia areata if it is bizarre incomplete we are going to think of trichotillomania the third important situation here is diffuse hair loss after a significant systemic stress the stress could be covid-19 it could be malaria it could be typhoid it could be pregnancy then my diagnosis is going to be telogen effluvium telogen effluvium effluvium means loss of hair effluvium means loss of hair and the fourth situation here a child presenting with a gray color scaly patch on the scalp now i'm going to make a diagnosis of tinea capitis gray patch type tinea capitis gray patch type and lastly if there is an adult with non scarring alopecia but it is a pattern type and the patient also says there is a genetic factor which is involved then i'm going to make a diagnosis of androgenetic alopecia then i'm going to make a diagnosis of androgenetic alopecia so these were the five important causes quickly let's look at the images number 1 you can see this well defined smooth surfaced circular patch with complete loss of hair diagnosis is alopecia areata sometimes the exam may say pits are present which are generally going to be superficial regular fine pits that further will add on to my diagnosis of alopecia areata the second situation here you can see this bizarre shape patch it's bizarre it's bald it's made up of broken hairs and incomplete loss of hair within the patch trichotillomania the third situation is after a significant stressor like covid-19 malaria typhoid loss of hair is called as telogen effluvium the fourth situation is a child presenting with a grayish color patch here with easily pluckability of hair then my diagnosis is going to be non inflammatory type of tinea capitis which is gray patch type and lastly the pattern alopecia which is going to be male and female pattern alopecia so please remember students in females what is going to be happening is the frontal hairline is maintained so in women generally what happens the frontal hairline is maintained and there is loss of hair over the central scalp so central scalp gets involved in females whereas in males what is going to happen 
there is balding of the vertex and always remember there is fronto temporal recession fronto temporal recession so these are the important points to diagnose patterned hair loss in men as well as women second case scenario students in appendages and disorder here we have an adult male or a female presenting with erythematous papillopustular eruption on the face two important differential diagnoses we need to consider here number 1 acne vulgaris number 1 acne vulgaris the second important dd here is rosacea rosacea now how to distinguish between these two conditions first is photosensitivity photosensitivity is a feature of rosacea this is point number 1 point number 2 the classical triggers so the classical triggers for rosacea are sunlight stress alcohol spicy food so these classical triggers are going to be there in rosacea these classical triggers are going to be absent in a patient of acne and very important feature to remember here is rosacea generally can have photosensitivity photosensitivity is a feature which can be there in rosacea now how will i diagnose acne so acne the classical lesion of acne is going to be comedones the special lesion of acne and usually the patient's skin in a patient of acne is going to be greasy so the background is generally greasy background or a oily background of the skin when i'm thinking of rosacea three important points come to my mind number 1 centrofacial erythema that means the patient generally has this redness mainly on the centrofacial aspect of the face second important point is flushing so the patient feels that the not only the face is red it is also feeling warm so the warmth component gets added to the redness we going to be calling it as flushing and the third important point here is telangiectasia the third important point here is telangiectasia so centrofacial erythema then telangiectasia and flushing these are the important points for rosacea and the sites now acne not only involves the face it can involve the chest it can also involve the trunk as well whereas rosacea is strictly a disorder of the central convexities of the face central convexities of the face is a very classical distribution of rosacea this is how we distinguish between these two conditions now here you can see a patient who has got comedones these are going to be called as the white heads also known as closed comedones you can see some closed comedones here so comedones are a special lesions they are going to be absent in a patient of rosacea whereas rosacea classically you have centrofacial erythema telangiectasia so here you can see the lot of redness over here and if this associated warmth we are going to be calling it as flushing as a feature let us take up some scenarios in connective tissue disease in connective tissue disease number 1 there is an adult female who gives history of reynolds phenomena now what is reynolds phenomena reynolds phenomena is characterized by episodic vasoconstriction so the patient's fingers are going to be going in for pallor then cyanosis then rubor so pallor cyanosis and rubor this is the sequential episodic vasoconstriction which is called as reynolds phenomena so it is going towards connective tissue disease and the skin thickening of the fingers extending proximal to the mcp so the question is saying the skin thickening of the fingers and it is extending proximal to the mcp so please remember the other name for skin thickening is scleroderma so thickening is sclero skin is derma so we are thinking about a disorder called as systemic sclerosis we are thinking about a disorder called as systemic sclerosis and we know systemic sclerosis is a disorder which is classified into two types limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis and the second one is going to be diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis so i am going to tell you clinically and dermatologically how do i distinguish between these two conditions now the first is going to be based on the skin thickening so based on the skin thickening please remember students in limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis the skin thickening involves distal to the elbow distal to the knee and face gets involved 
this is called as limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis whereas in diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis it is distal that means distal is already involved plus proximal to the elbow proximal to the elbow proximal to the knee and trunk gets involved so then the process is more diffuse let us look at the second point the second point talks about the relationship between reynolds phenomenon and skin thickening so please remember reynolds phenomena there's a long history long history which precedes the skin thickening so many many years before there would be history of reynolds phenomena which is going on then the skin thickening develops whereas here there's a very short history of reynolds phenomena generally within one year of starting of reynolds phenomena or together with reynolds phenomena skin thickening may start the most important antibody to remember here for limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis is anti centromere antibodies anti centromere antibodies the best way to remember this is the other name for limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis is crest syndrome that is calcinosis reynolds phenomena esophageal dysmotility sclerodactyly and telangiectasia from the first letter c you can remember anti centromere antibodies for limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis whereas for diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis it is going to be anti scl70 so anti scl70 antibodies are for diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis case scenario number 2 here we have an adult presenting with facial lesions and photosensitivity generally these facial lesions are red in color that is what we need to remember and this photosensitivity two important differential diagnosis to remember number 1 is rosacea number 1 is going to be rosacea the second important dd here is students systemic lupus erythematosus what are the key features to distinguish between rosacea and sle now please remember students rosacea is going to be having those classical triggers like sunlight alcohol hot beverages spicy food these are all vasodilators and vasodilators are going to worsen rosacea whereas in a patient of sle we are going to have systemic features systemic features are fever joint pain oral ulcers fever joint pain and oral ulcers second point is pertaining skin lesions the various skin lesions of rosacea we have already discussed centrofacial erythema flushing telangiectasia you can also have papulopustules so these are the variety of lesions which you can get in rosacea whereas in sle what you going to have you going to have erythema which is also known as the butterfly rash and in terms of distribution this also i've already discussed you have the central convexities of the face which is getting involved here whereas sle you have the malar area plus bridge of the nose gets involved so if there's malar area plus the bridge of the nose gets involved then it is going to be feature suggestive of systemic lupus erythematosus so always remember students you cannot distinguish with one point there are multiple points here so keep everything in mind then only mark your answer in the exam so here we can see a patient of rosacea who has this flushing and those will be the features which are going to be mentioned and here we have a patient of a malar rash also known as the butterfly rash and here generally the nasolabial fold also tends to be spared the next topic is skin and systems case scenario number 1 there is a question which is telling us that there is an adult male presenting with asymptomatic skin lesions distributed over the anterior aspect of the leg two important differential diagnosis is what we need to consider number 1 nld which stands for necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum so necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum this is the first differential diagnosis second important differential diagnosis here is pretibial myxedema pretibial myxedema now let us see how to distinguish between nld versus pretibial myxedema so how to distinguish between these two conditions is in necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum see the word lipoidica is there that is why we can see there is lot of yellowish discoloration in the plaque here so you get a waxy yellow 
atrophic plaque and carefully if you observe you can also see this reddish tinge over here this is referred to as surface telangiectasia this is referred to as surface telangiectasia so waxy yellow atrophic plaque with surface telangiectasia is the morphology and the distribution is anterior aspect of the leg the association that's why this is called diabetic corum is diabetes mellitus is diabetes mellitus the second condition is pre tibial myxedema how will pre tibial myxedema present non pitting type of diffuse edema non pitting type of diffuse edema please remember students many get confused in the exam the word if myxedema is mentioned it is hypothyroidism but pre tibial myxedema is associated with graves disease which is hyperthyroidism which is hyperthyroidism and please keep this point in mind that pre tibial myxedema is also referred to as thyroid dermopathy it is also referred to as thyroid dermopathy next is pediatric dermatology in pediatric dermatology let us take up case scenario number 1 so there is a child presenting with fever and maculopapular rash on day 4 of the illness so child fever maculopapular rash day 4 of the illness two important differential diagnosis to consider number 1 measles number 1 is measles number 2 sixth disease sixth disease so students please remember pediatric question in the exam the other names for sixth disease number 1 exanthem subitum exanthem means rash on the body subitum means abrupt sudden high fever suddenly the fever comes down suddenly the rash appears so this is one thing you need to remember exanthem subitum is also referred to as roseola infantum roseola infantum so we have these two important differential diagnoses in mind how do we distinguish between measles and roseola infantum number 1 first is the site of the rash please remember measles the rash is going to start on the face behind the ears and then it is going to be progressing to the neck trunk and extremities so it is going to follow this kind of a pattern whereas roseola infantum generally the rash starts on the trunk and moves outwards and face is generally spared face is generally spared so the rash starts from the trunk and moves outwards and generally face is spared the second point here is with the onset of rash what will happen in measles with the onset of rash the fever increases for the next 2 to 3 days very very important point what is going to happen with roseola infantum with the onset of the rash fever decreases fever decreases very very important clue students to pick up in an mcq exam next is the fate how is measles going to heal it leaves behind residual hyperpigmentation residual hyperpigmentation is going to be there whereas here residual hyperpigmentation is going to be absent and in the oral cavity this was this year's neat pg exam question coplic spots you are going to be having coplic spots which are seen across the buccal mucosa whereas in roseola infantum the name of the spot is nagayama spots naga yama spots these are also referred to as uvulo plateau glossal spots so these red color papules are distributed over the uvula and the tongue that is what you need to remember together with the palate that's why it's called as uvulo glosso palatal spots very very important points to distinguish between measles and roseola infantum so this is the measles rash which i told you starts behind the ear goes to the neck trunk and the extremities leaves behind hyperpigmentation whereas sixth disease starts from the trunk moves outwards and face is spared in roseola infantum case scenario number 2 question is saying in the exam child fever with a vesicular rash so please remember the word vesicle vesicle is a fluid filled lesion which is measuring less than 1 cm 
So child fever, vesicular rash, two important differential diagnoses in the exam. Number one, varicella. Number two, hand, foot, mouth disease, HFMD. So how do we distinguish between varicella and hand, foot, mouth disease? Number one is the site of the rash. So please remember the, what is the distribution of varicella? Varicella mainly involves the trunk. It is centripetal in distribution. But as if you look at hand, foot, mouth disease, it is mainly acral in distribution. When you say acral, what I mean is palms, soles. But apart from palms and soles, please remember buttocks and oral cavity can also have lesions. So this is the first point you need to remember. The second point is going to be regarding the morphology of the rash. So initially in varicella, we get macules, then papules then vesicles, then pustules, then scab. So these are the stages of the evolution. But please remember what is special about varicella is all these stages can be present simultaneously at the same time. This is referred to as a pleomorphic rash. This is referred to as a pleomorphic rash. Whereas in hand, foot, mouth disease, generally you have papulovesicles, which tend to ulcerate, which tend to ulcerate. So this pleomorphic rash is a very characteristic feature which is seen in varicella. So here we can see a child with varicella. You can see these vesicles on red base, vesicles on red base. This is also referred to as dew drop on rose petal appearance. Dew drop on rose petal appearance, which is very, very classical for a varicella patient. And this is a patient of hand, foot, mouth disease. You can see these oval vesicles here, distributed over the palms, soles, buttocks and oral cavity. Very, very important is hand, foot, mouth disease, which is produced by Coxsackie A16 and enterovirus number 71. So these are the causative agents of hand, foot, mouth disease. We are going to be discussing infectious diseases, which is going to be extremely high yield for your exam. These are the overlap topics between microbiology and dermatology. We'll take up the first case scenario here. The first case scenario is of an agricultural worker who gives history of trauma, presenting with a verrucous or a warty plaque on the foot. So first we'll try to understand whenever there is a word called verrucous in dermatology, what does it mean? It means anything in dermatology which is going to be having a rough or an uneven surface rough or uneven surface. That is why it is also known as a warty plaque, rough uneven surface. Two important differential diagnoses to consider. Number one, tuberculosis verrucosa cutis, tuberculosis verrucosa cutis. Number two, chromoblastomycosis, chromoblastomycosis. So these are the two important differential diagnoses, TBVC and chromoblastomycosis. Now, this is how a TBVC presents. You can see this warty plaque which is there on the foot. How to distinguish? Get a MANTU test done. So this is a MANTU test. Positivity is going to be noted in tuberculosis verrucosa cutis. Chromoblastomycosis is also referred to as verrucous dermatitis. It is also referred to as verrucous dermatitis. And please remember, student, the meaning of the word chromo. Chromo means color. Chromoblastomycosis is produced by pigmented fungi. It is produced by pigmented fungi. Now, pigmented fungi means dematiaceous fungi. Dematiaceous fungi. That means these fungi have got color in their structure itself. And here you can see this warty plaque which is there on the foot. The best way to identify this condition is do a potassium hydroxide mount. And what you see here is this brown, round, thick-walled bodies. These brown, round, thick-walled bodies are called copper pennies. Copper penny bodies, also known as sclerotic bodies, also known as medlar bodies. So please remember, these are the three names for these brown, round, thick-walled bodies. The treatment for this condition is itraconazole. The treatment of this condition is itraconazole. Second case scenario in infectious diseases, there is an adult male presenting with hypopigmented macules on the trunk. So when there is an adult male, hypopigmented macules on the trunk, three important differential diagnoses to consider. Number one, 
பிட்டீரியாசிஸ் வசிகலர் நம்பர் ஒன் பிட்டீரியாசிஸ் வசிகலர் நம்பர் டூ ஹேன்சன்ஸ் டிசீஸ் நம்பர் டூ ஹேன்சன்ஸ் டிசீஸ் நம்பர் த்ரீ போஸ்ட் காலா அசார் டர்மல் லிஷ்மேனியாசிஸ் பிகேடியா ஸோ த்ரீ இம்பார்ட்டன் டிஃபரென்ஷியல் டயக்னோசிஸ் பிட்ரியாசிஸ் வர்சிகுலர் ஹேன்சன்ஸ் டிசீஸ் அண்ட் நம்பர் த்ரீ இஸ் போஸ்ட் காலா அசார் டர்மல் லிஷ்மேனியாசிஸ் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் லெட் இஸ் லுக் அட் பிட்ரியாசிஸ் வர்சிகுலர் வாட் கைண்ட் ஆஃப் லீஷன்ஸ் ஆர் வி கோண்டு கெட் ஹியர் வி ஆர் கோண்டு கெட் பெரி ஃபாலிகுலர் லீஷன்ஸ் ஸோ ஹியர் we know that malus is a fur fur or globosa is going to be targeting the hair follicle so peri follicular scaly lesions number 2 the scales in petriasis versicolor are referred to as fine brani fur fur ratio scales fine brani fur fur ratio scales so this is the scaling of petriasis versicolor next important site is going to be trunk and fourth point is a clinical sign so what i do is i take my nail and scratch the lesion the scaling becomes prominent in petriasis versicolor this is referred to as scratch test also referred to as besnier sign also referred to as besnier sign so all we have to do is take our nail and scratch the lesion scaling becomes prominent and to confirm the diagnosis you have to do a potassium hydroxide mount you get short hyphae plus round spores short hyphae are compared to spaghetti round spores are compared to meatballs that is why this is referred to as spaghetti and meatball appearance very classical of petriasis versicolor next differential was hansen's disease now usually in an exam scenario a patient of hansen's is going to be from one of the endemic regions for hansen's so an endemic region like bihar up tamil nadu may be mentioned in the exam number 2 please remember what goes against hansen's is hansen is a non scaly condition third thing is sensation so please remember sensation is impaired in hansen's but can be normal in lepromatous leprosy in lepromatous leprosy the sensation over the skin lesions may be normal but most of the other times there is impaired sensation in hansen's next is peripheral nerve examination please remember Hansen is more of a disease of the nerve than skin so nerve is very very important there is peripheral nerve thickening here and lastly you do the slit skin smear for acid fast bacteria you will get positive for acid fast bacteria so the definitive diagnosis is going to be by a slit skin smear for acid fast bacteria The next important differential diagnosis is post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis. So here what is the history? Again the history is going to be of an endemic region for leishmaniasis or rather visceral leishmaniasis. So Bihar may be mentioned in the question. The second point is what past history would I want to elicit? So please remember this is post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis. So what is kala azar students? Please remember kala azar is called as visceral leishmaniasis. So how do I elicit history of visceral leishmaniasis? There will be past history of prolonged fever. So prolonged fever in the past is one clue which is going to tell you probably the patient has visceral leishmaniasis we also known as visceral leishmaniasis is going to present with massive splenomegaly right the two important points of visceral leishmaniasis the next important point sensations are always normal here and then peripheral nerves are not involved peripheral nerves are not involved in post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis and very important is the definitive diagnosis is by a crust tissue smear so when you look at the crust tissue smear you get ld bodies please remember microbiology question a mastigote form a mastigote form so here also you can see multiple hypopigmented macular lesions looks exactly like hansen's the only way to distinguish is the nerve parameter peripheral nerve thickening present you go for hansen's disease if it says it is normal then consider post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis next case scenario there is an adult male presenting with swelling over the foot with discharging sinuses so foot swelling sinus formation what should i think very very important number one is mycetoma this is my first dd second is going to be bacterial pseudomycetoma bacterial pseudomycetoma so please remember students the other name for bacterial pseudomycetoma is botryomycosis 
botryomycosis is the other name for bacterial pseudomycetoma now we know the classical trial of mycetoma you have swelling formation sinus formation and then you have discharging granules now please remember mycetoma is divided into eumycetoma and actinomycetoma and eumycetoma we should remember is fungal in origin so you do the appropriate cultures investigation look for fungi and actinomycetoma is produced by filamentous bacteria filamentous bacteria so the main way to distinguish it is microbiologically look at the cause whereas if i'm talking about botryomycosis or bacterial pseudomycetoma please remember the most common organism here is going to be staphylococcus aureus so in the culture you are going to be looking for microbiological features of staph aureus so please remember clinically it is almost impossible to distinguish between mycetoma and botryomycosis you have to use the microbiology department's help to help you distinguish the causative organism and that will change your diagnosis case scenario number 4 now if we look at this case this case is talking about a patient presenting with fever and sheet like epidermal peeling so when you get these pick up points fever with sheet like epidermal peeling two important differential diagnosis to consider number 1 staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome so this is number 1 and number 2 is toxic epidermal necrolysis toxic epidermal necrolysis so how are we going to distinguish these two conditions first let's take up staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome so here there always will be a history of distant focus of infection so when i say distant focus of infection it could be in the conjunctiva it could be in the ears so the focus could be conjunctivitis it could be otitis media second important is the mechanism now please remember here staphylococcus aureus produces a toxin and this toxin is responsible for splitting the skin so please remember the mechanism here is acantholysis okay it is toxin mediated and this is going to be producing acantholysis that's a very important mechanism third the initial features here so please remember one of the initial features will be periorifacial erythema so you're going to have redness around the orifices that's periorifacial erythema and why are we discussing this topic because the differential diagnosis of fever with sheet like epidermal peeling you can see some sheet like epidermal peeling happening there so what is the other important point to remember the clinical sign whenever the sheet like epidermal peeling is nikolsky sign and we've already studied in bullos disorders when the mechanism is acantholysis we are going to be having true nikolsky sign true nikolsky sign and then we examine the oral cavity please remember students when this toxin i was talking about this is going to cleave desmoglein number 1 and please remember we already studied it in bullos disorders desmoglein 1 is expressed in low concentration in oral cavity higher concentration in the oral cavity is desmoglein 3 so because desmoglein 1 is targeted mucosa is normal in this condition just similar to pemphigus foliaceus so we also have studied in bullos disorder desmoglein 1 is involved in pemphigus foliaceus that is why in both these conditions mucosa is not involved whereas when i'm talking about toxic epidermal necrolysis number 1 history there will be history of drug intake here it could be an anti epileptic it could be allopurinol it could be an art anti retroviral therapy second thing is the mechanism what happens over here students in toxic epidermal necrolysis you are going to be having keratinocyte necrosis keratinocyte necrosis and please remember this point that the keratinocyte necrosis happening in tn is involving full thickness of the epidermis full thickness of the epidermis is going to be involved here the initial feature of toxic epidermal necrolysis is going to be atypical target lesions atypical target lesions so generally when we learn in dermatology target lesion is a lesion in dermatology seen in erythema multiforme which has three zones atypical target lesions have got two zones okay that's important and then the clinical sign that we want to elicit here is called pseudo nikolsky sign so true nikolsky sign 
the mechanism is a cantholysis pseudo nikolsky sign which is giving tangential pressure over the skin is elicited over here and here the mechanism is keratinocyte necrosis very very important when we define in our regular classes what is the definition of tn we call it as acute life threatening severe mucocutaneous drug reaction that means mucosa should be involved in a patient of tn so here you are going to get hemorrhagic crus here we are going to get hemorrhagic crus so these are the key points to distinguish between SSSS and toxic epidermal necrolysis. Now let us take up some case scenarios very very important in the exam in sexually transmitted diseases. Number one, an adult male with history of high risk exposure. So high risk exposure means exposure to sexually transmitted infections presents with asymptomatic skin colored lesions on the genitals. So when I see asymptomatic skin colored lesions on the genitals, I have two important differential diagnosis students. Number one, condyloma. Accuminator. The second important differential diagnosis here is condyloma lata. So these are the two important differential diagnoses to consider. Now let us see how to distinguish between the two. First is the etiology. Please remember condyloma accuminator is produced by HPV 6 and 11 low risk types in 90% of the patients and HPV 16, 18 high risk types in 10% of the patients. So majority of the times it is going to be the low risk types and rarely it can be high risk type because this also has been asked in the previous NEET exam questions. The causative organism of condyloma lata is going to be Triponema pallidum because this is a form of secondary syphilis. This is a form of secondary syphilis. The second point here is morphology. Now, when I look at the word acuminata, what is the meaning of the word acuminata? Pointed. So, the patient is going to present as asymptomatic, fleshy, pointed, pink, papules and plaques. Asymptomatic, fleshy, pointed, pink, papules and plaques whereas condyloma lata the meaning of the word lata is flat so flat topped moist papules and plaques so now we understand how do we distinguish so please remember that accuminata means pointed lesions lata means flat lesion the next important point is what investigation I want to do. Here, the investigation I want to do in a condyloma accuminator is going to be called as histopathology and I'm going to get a cell called as coilocyte. Now, coilocyte is a cell which we read repeatedly in pathology. It is described as a squamous epithelial cell, hyperchromatic nucleus and a perinuclear halo. That is a coilocyte. Whereas, when we are talking about condyloma lata, we are talking about secondary syphilis. And please remember students, the best investigation in a patient of secondary syphilis is VDRL or RPR. So VDRL or RPR is the best investigation for secondary syphilis. Now here we can see in the image here, you can see this asymptomatic, fleshy, pointed, pink, papules and plaques. So usually they are seen on the coronal sulcus and they are seen on the frenulum. These are the most important sites for friction during a sexual intercourse. And what do we see in condyloma lata? Lata means flat. So we can see this flat topped moist papules and plaques over the genital area. Go for the diagnosis of condyloma lata. Lata means flat. The treatment of condyloma accuminata just for completion purpose. Number one is podophyllin and number two is imiquimod. So podophyllin is a drug which is going to be targeting the mitotic spindle and it produces what necrosis? Imiquimod is a toll-like receptor number seven agonist. So it's a TLR. TLR, please remember students, is toll-like receptor number seven agonist. It stimulates your immune response. Whereas condyloma lata, I want to give injection benzathine penicillin 2.4 million units deep IM single dose. Now the question is why should I give only single dose? So please remember students condyloma lata is secondary syphilis and secondary syphilis is classified as early syphilis. So please remember in early syphilis all that we have to do is give a single dose of injection benzathine penicillin 2.4 million units deep IM after a test dose single dose.
नेक्स्ट केस सिनेरियो नंबर टू एन अडल्ट मेल विथ हिस्ट्री ऑफ हाई रिस्क एक्सपोजर अगेन हाई रिस्क टू सेक्शुअली ट्रांसमिटेड इलनेसेस एंड यूरेथ्रल डिस्चार्ज दैट मीन्स द क्वेश्चन इज आस्किंग मी अबाउट यूरेथ्राइटिस नाउ वेन आई एम लुकिंग एट यूरेथ्राइटिस वी हैव टू इंपॉर्टेंट डिफरेंशियल डायग्नोसिस इयर वन इज गोनोकॉकल यूरेथ्राइटिस एंड द सेकेंड वन इज non gonococcal urethritis so these are the two important diseases gonococcal and non gonococcal urethritis now how to distinguish the two first we look at the incubation period the incubation period is a short incubation period of 2 to 5 days non gonococcal it is going to be 7 to 14 days when we talk about dysuria please remember students when you studying this table gonorrhea is a severe disease so you're going to be having severe dysuria here whereas in non gonococcal urethritis the dysuria is going to be variable talking about the urethral discharge now what is the meaning of the word gonorrhea gono means seed rhea means flow that means the discharge is flowing out you are going to be having profuse purulent discharge profuse purulent urethral discharge is the feature here the opposite of profuse is scanty the opposite of purulent is mucoid discharge so scanty mucoid urethral discharge is a feature of non gonococcal urethritis let us now move on to the investigation in investigation what do i want to do for gonococcal urethritis i want to do a gram stain and on gram stain what am i looking for in neisseria gonorrhea gram negative intracellular diplococci is going to be suggestive of neisseria gonorrhea and when we look at the causes of non gonococcal urethritis we have multiple causes there is urea plasma this mycoplasma this trichomonas vaginalis please remember students the most common cause is going to be chlamydia trachomatis chlamydia trachomatis d2k serovar this is what everybody should remember the most common cause and generally for chlamydia the best investigation to do is nat nat stands for nucleic acid amplification test so here we can see the profuse purulent urethral discharge seen from the urethral meatus of a patient after a short incubation period is suggestive of gonorrhea if we look at the treatment of gonococcal urethritis first we want to give injection ceftriaxone 500 mg im in a patient who is less than 150 kg plus i want to add doxycycline 100 mg bd for 7 days but please keep this point in mind cdc clearly mentions you have to give doxycycline if chlamydia is not excluded if chlamydia is not excluded definitely you should be giving doxycycline 100 mg bd for 7 days when we look at the treatment of non gonococcal urethritis number one we go for tablet azithromycin 1 g stat or doxycycline same dose is again 100 mg bd for 7 days 100 mg bd for 7 days the next topic is syndromic management of urethral discharge now syndrome refers to a collection of symptoms and signs so in order to treat an std based on symptoms and signs the national aids control organization has come up with kits when we are going to be treating urethritis or cervicitis we need to remember that we are using kit number 1 which is gray in color so it is used for urethritis cervicitis now please remember cervicitis means on per speculum examination if you have cervical erosion ulcer discharge you have to use kit number 1 and anorectal discharge and anorectal discharge two important drugs are given in number 1 cefixim 400 mg one stat this is going to be covering gonococci and the second important one is you're going to give azithromycin 1 g stat this is to cover chlamydia this is for the coverage of chlamydia case scenario number 3 adult female presents with vaginal discharge three important differential diagnosis we want to consider apart from the physiological causes number 1 we are looking at candidiasis trichomoniasis and number 3 we are looking at bacterial vaginosis bacterial vaginosis so most of us know that candidiasis is produced by 
Candida species. Trichomoniasis is produced by Trichomonas vaginalis. And bacterial vaginosis, please remember it is not an STD. It's not sexually transmitted disease. So what is it? It is an altered vaginal microflora. It is altered vaginal microflora. That's what we need to have a concept about bacterial vaginosis. That's why we don't have to treat the partner in bacterial vaginosis. Now, first we look at candidiasis. The type of discharge that we get here is called as curdy white discharge. Curdy white vaginal discharge. Next, we look at trichomoniasis. In trichomoniasis, two points to remember. Number one is greenish yellow frothy discharge greenish yellow frothy vaginal discharge one more important cervical finding where you get multiple punctate hemorrhages over the cervix you can see this multiple punctate hemorrhages over the cervix this is referred to as strawberry cervix this is going to be getting the name of strawberry cervix very important for trichomoniasis and then bacterial vaginosis how do i describe the discharge homogeneous white adherent discharge so homogeneous white adherent discharge and when we look at the syndromic management of vaginal discharge we are going to be using kit number two which is green in color for vaginal discharge and we have these important drugs to remember number one is going to be tablet fluconazole 150 mg one stat this is going to be covering the spectrum of candida and the second drug is secnidazole 1 gram bd so this is going to be covering bacterial vaginosis and trichomoniasis case scenario number four so adult male with history of high risk sexual exposure presents with genital ulcers now when the word genital ulcer is given in the question I immediately have to think about genital ulcer diseases, which are five in number. So the best way to approach this question is to classify the causes of genital ulcers. So broadly, we can classify them like this into single and painless ulcers, multiple and painful ulcers, also known as multiple and tender genital ulcers. So here, in the first category, there are three causes. In the second category, there are two causes. Now, which are the three important STDs which present with single painless ulcers? Number one is primary syphilis. Number two, donovanosis. Number three, lymphogranuloma valerium. So these are the three STDs which are single and painless. Which are the STDs which are multiple and tender? Shankroid. and genital herpes and genital herpes now whenever there is a single painless genital ulcer we have already kept those three causes in mind now how do i further segregate them i immediately look at the inguinal lymph nodes this is very very important so suppose the question says inguinal lymph nodes are painless then i am going to mark it as primary syphilis Suppose the question says inguinal lymph nodes are painful, then I'm going to be marking as lymphogranuloma venarium, where you also get something known as a bubo, which is a suppurative lymph node. And if the question says there's a single painless genital ulcer with no inguinal lymph nodes involved, then I will mark my diagnosis as donovanosis. Now, please remember students, the other name for donovanosis is granuloma inguinal granuloma inguinal now let us see the ulcer of primary syphilis so primary syphilis is also referred to as hard chancre also referred to as hard chancre so you can see the single ulcer over here so how do i describe the single ulcer it is described as single clean based indurated ulcer please remember students that is why it is called as hard chancre so it's single clean based indurated non-tender and there's no bleeding on touch 
so this is the characteristic of a genital ulcer of syphilis and the investigation of choice from this ulcer is going to be dark ground microscopy so dark ground microscopy of the ulcer exuded where i'll be looking at the motility the cox screw motility of the treponema pallidum here we have the second important example you look at this ulcer this is the classical ulcer of donovanosis which is produced by klebsiella granulomatis please remember it is not leishmania donovani donovanosis is produced by klebsiella granulomatis and here this is described as a beefy red ulcer which bleeds on touch beefy red genital ulcer which bleeds on touch this is going to give me a differential diagnosis of donovanosis and inguinal lymph nodes are normal only thing is in the groin you can get a subcutaneous nodule and this subcutaneous nodule which is seen in donovanosis this is called as pseudobubo called as pseudobubo this is going to be seen in donovanosis this is going to be seen in donovanosis and when i am talking about multiple tender genital ulcers again i mentioned i talk about inguinal lymphadenopathy if the inguinal lymph nodes are painful but there is a suppurative bubo if this bubo formation bubo means the lymph node is enlarged with pus formation then i will mark my diagnosis as chancroid whereas if the question says there is enlargement of lymph nodes there is painful inguinal lymphadenopathy but no bubo if bubo is absent then i can mark my diagnosis as genital herpes so please remember students usually if the examiner wants you to mark genital herpes there will be history of vesicles prior the ulcer so if the question says there are vesicular lesions fluid filled lesions prior to the onset of the ulcer then i can mark my diagnosis as genital herpes so here we can see in the picture you can see these multiple tender ulcers please remember this is also referred to as soft sore or soft chancre hard chancre is seen in primary syphilis soft chancre is seen in chancroid which is produced by hemophilus ducreae and we know what investigation we want to do we want to do a gram stain we want to be looking for gram negative cocobacilli gram negative cocobacilli which are arranged in long parallel strands so gram negative cocobacilli arranged in long parallel strands this is referred to as school of fish appearance school of fish appearance also referred to as railroad track appearance rail road track appearance so this is the classical microscopy of hemophilus ducreae whereas when i'm looking at genital ulcer disease due to herpes you can see these multiple ulcers which are grouped and then you also see some ulcers wherein the separate separate ulcers have merged together to form this very classical polycyclic margins polycyclic margins and to repeat once again please remember students that genital herpes is usually preceded by vesicle formation let us take up case scenarios in relation to hansens case scenario number 1 child presents with hypopigmented macular lesions on the face two important differential diagnosis to consider number 1 pityriasis alba pityriasis alba the second important differential diagnosis here is indeterminate hansens disease indeterminate hansens disease so child hypopigmented macules on the face think about these two conditions pityriasis alba and indeterminate hansens now how do we distinguish these conditions the first point is history so pityriasis alba is a type of endogenous eczema okay it is usually seen in children with dry skin so there will be history of atopy if you remember in the previous model i have already mentioned atopy means recurrent allergic rhinitis bronchial asthma and atopic dermatitis that is called as atopy and in indeterminate hansens what history is going to be there the child presenting from an endemic region for leprosy bihar up tamil nadu so bihar up tamil nadu will be given in the question because it is seen in indeterminate hansens next important point is scaling please remember pityriasis means scaling so here scaling is present in leprosy scaling is absent 
next let's talk about sensation sensations are normal in p alba please remember it indeterminate also the sensation is normal because it represents the early stage of leprosy sensation is not lost here another way if you are in confusion is to do a histopathological examination on histopathology we know that pityriasis alba is an eczema so we can expect spongiosis so what is spongiosis students it is intraepidermal intercellular edema so in the epidermis between the cells if you get water this is called a spongiosis whereas in a patient of indeterminate hansen's disease what will we get we are going to be getting peri neural and peri appendageal so we are going to get peri neural around the nerves around the appendages like sweat glands sebaceous glands lymphocytosis lymphocytosis that is why the investigation of choice for indeterminate leprosy is skin biopsy skin biopsy here you can see vague hypopigmented scaly macular lesions over here so this is pityriasis alba this is a child with indeterminate hansen's disease next case scenario there is an adult male with hansen's so the case scenario is telling it is a leprosy patient he has been started on multi basilary multi drug therapy which is the standard treatment for hansen's develops signs of inflammation is developing signs of inflammation so we should know whenever we talk about hansen's we are talking about a chronic process and here what the question is trying to tell us is in a chronic process like hansen's if something acute happens what is my diagnosis my diagnosis will be lepra reaction okay my diagnosis is lepra reaction there are two important forms in india to consider number one type 1 lepra reaction and type 2 lepra reaction so type 1 lepra reaction and type 2 lepra reaction these are the two forms of lepra reaction now let us look at this very very important table frequently asked in the exam how do we distinguish the two now please remember type 1 lepra reaction is usually seen in which spectrum of the disease it is seen whenever the word borderline comes and there are three situations where you can get the word borderline bt bb and bl whereas when i'm looking at type 2 lepra reaction i'm talking about the word lepromatous spectrum and we know in hansen's there are two forms of hansen's where the word lepromatous comes so we have bl and ll leprosy now what type of hypersensitivity reaction is type 1 type 1 is an example for type 4 hypersensitivity reaction which is the delayed type type 2 is characterized by immune complex formation so it's an example for type 3 hypersensitivity reaction and when we looking at skin lesions please remember i was talking about acute inflammation during the course of leprosy so if the existing skin lesions become red and tender so please remember the key word here is existing skin lesions become red and tender this is called as type 1 lepra reaction if there is emergence of new red tender nodules so if there is emergence of red new tender nodules my diagnosis is going to be type 2 lepra reaction please remember the other name for type 2 lepra reaction is enl enl stands for erythema nodosum leprosum erythema because it is red in color nodosum because you get nodular lesions leprosum in a lepromatous spectrum that's why this condition is called as erythema nodosum leprosum next we look at nerve involvement in type 1 lepra reaction you have very severe neuritis so very severe neuritis is a feature of type 1 lepra reaction whereas in type 2 lepra reaction nerves may be involved or may not be involved but when talking of systemic features systemic features are generally absent in type 1 lepra reaction whereas in type 2 as i told you there is antigen antibody forms an immune complex it can go and deposit all over the body the patient has got fever can have iridocyclitis can have arthritis orchitis glomerulonephritis so you can have multiple types of systemic involvement in type 2 lepra reaction because it is a immune complex mediated disease so here you can see this was a patient who had a 
hypopigmented patch on the face and what happens in type 1 lepra reaction how am i going to identify it in the exam the examiner will tell you the existing lesions of hansen's have become red and tender mark type 1 lepra reaction very severe neuritis is associated whereas in type 2 lepra reaction you can see these multiple nodular lesions so obviously by looking at this picture you can't make out a nodule you can just see the erythema right that is because a nodule is a lesion which is felt it is a deeper lesion in dermatology and these erythematous nodular lesions are referred to as enl erythema nodosum leprosum and please remember whenever type of lepra reaction is asked in the exam please remember the principle of treatment is always going to be continue multi drug therapy so please remember do not stop the multi drug therapy thinking that the patient has developed acute inflammation and if they ask you drug of choice it is systemic steroids it is going to be systemic steroids with this we conclude session on clinical vignettes in dermatology thank you